I grew up in Iowa, and my parents um, kind of blue collar workers. My dad was a mechanic, and my mom worked at a factory where they make clothes. I was the youngest of five children. Uh, my parents, I think, felt their duty so much was just to have the roof and the food that, that they did that, and so anything else we needed, we kind of fended for ourselves. From 12 to 18, I really led my life very worldly. I mean, it was all about instant gratification. And when I was 14, I ended up getting pregnant and gave the baby up for adoption and, and didn't talk, talk about it again for probably seven years. So obviously, with that kind of lifestyle, it paints the picture of, you know, do what you want when you screw up, don't tell anybody. After high school, I went to college, but went to too many social events and didn't um, make it. So ended up going up from Iowa to California, and kind of was this liberal, happy-go-lucky peacemaker girl. It really was a goal to try every drug once. That point that happened, I had met my husband that I'm now married to. I'm uh, at this point stationed at Fort Ord out in, out in California, field artillery officer, kind of living a little bit of the, uh, of the Top Gun, you know, life, if, if nothing more than in my own mind. He was not a Christian either, but he had qualities that I admired. Just a great guy. We dated for four months. He asked me to marry him. I said yes. After two months of marriage, I got pregnant. And then uh, my son was born and got pregnant again with my daughter. So really, on uh, year four of our marriage, I think I just had a complete and utter identity crisis. All of a sudden, a mother in Tennessee of two, and I had no idea what I was doing but I really got to a point where I quite frankly hated my husband. I mean, everything you know that I loved about him initially became a thorn in my side. And I, I really wanted out of my marriage. I just did not want to be married to this uptight military guy. To see the, the effects, uh, the impact of, of you know, just our selfish, self-oriented you know, perspective uh, on life, and that just started to create just a lot of difficulties in our marriage. So we really both started being at the end of ourselves at the same time. And I had a Bible. The very first Bible verse I read is, God hates divorce. And that was really kind of a defining moment for me because I remember thinking, okay, if God hates divorce, I have to make this work. And with that, I went up to my bathroom and was just pleading. I mean, crying my heart out, saying, with everything that's in me, Lord, I don't want to do this. I mean, just crying and crying and saying, please give me a break. I don't want to stay. I don't want to stay. And he said, I gave you a break and your break was Jesus Christ. Get up off the floor. I really felt at that time, I kept hearing him say to me, give it two years, give it two years. And what happened is, is we both just came sold out to the Lord and realized we were doing everything in life and in our marriage wrong. Just a recognition that, you know, God, I can't, I can't fix this and uh, and just a strong sense of the own uh, of my own sin in my life and just uh, and just that need to you know just God I just I, I surrender I grew right away because I, I jumped into Bible study fellowship you know ended up at a great church where they just took us in that first year we really just to get to know the Lord did really every Bible study um, church related that I could. I wish I would have lived my life from birth pleasing the Lord. And I think because of my very colored past, the other side that's so sweet is that God doesn't, you know, He doesn't see any of that anymore. And that's why it gives me a passion to talk to high school girls and teach them the truth. I mean, God uses all those, you know, He says He restores the years the locusts have eaten. And I cling to that. Chose this morning to show you guys that video because I want it to be an introduction for us. I, I prayed and asked the Lord, Lord, how, how do I bring this message to the people? What do you want me to precursor what you put on my heart uh, for everyone to, to be able to grab a hold of what we're trying to talk about this morning? And God directed me to this particular video <clears throat> as a way of introduction. So this morning I want to preach you a message simply like this. Surrender as a Christian. Surrender as a Christian, living a, fulfill, a fulfilled life. We think about being surrendered, and that is, a, that is a term that you hear from me a lot of times, and I'm sure that you've heard that throughout your Christian journey, is to surrender to Christ. And there is a, there is a real sacrifice involved with surrender. 
Um, you know, when I, before I got up here and I said, you know, Brother Roger didn't realize that what he was saying was it's almost an interlude to what I wanted to preach on here today. And I believe God was in the midst of what he said uh, to help us get to this place where we can look and talk about surrender. Surrender has become a dirty word in the church. It's a word that most people don't want to be a part of. They want to come every once in a while. They want to hang out when it's convenient. Uh, most people want to uh, say that they're a Christian, wear the tag, but never, never have the fruits on their tree. Can I tell you this morning, that's not pleasing with our Heavenly Father. In any form or fashion, that is not pleasing. As a matter of fact, God wants us to completely give ourselves to Him because He completely gave Himself to us. Now, where would we be here today? Let me just ask you a probing question. Where would we be this morning if God had not given himself completely to us? I speculate on that from time to time. If God had not poured himself into us the way that he did through his darling son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for our sins, where would I personally be here today? I can tell you my mind wouldn't be in the state in which it is right now. I, I, I've... I shudder to think what it might would look like when my thought processes would run wild, and yours as well. I shudder to think here this morning that my actions may not be reflective of anything that is holy and righteous if God had not poured himself into me and into you the way that he has. So in turn, God asked us to do one thing. He asked us to surrender. Surrender is a, is a broad spectrum of different things, but in one word, God asked us to give ourselves to him in surrenderance. This morning, I want to preach you that message, but before I do, I want to ask God to bless our time. Father, help us today. We, we've come to this place this morning to worship you, and I thank you for uh, the good worship already. I thank you, dear God, that your presence is already felt. Lord, I thank you, dear God, for Brother Roger bringing a word this morning that was right on time. I thank you, dear Lord, for Teresa who sang with him. I, I praise you for what has taken place in this place. But God, right now we've come to the point where we need to look at your word and see how it applies to our life. Help us before we leave this place to make a decision as to whether we're going to really truly so, uh, sell out to you or we can continue to live the way we always have. In Jesus' name, amen. You think about surrender and and I, I'm going to say this to you here. There may be some in here that have completely surrendered their heart and life to Jesus Christ, but there may be some folks sitting in here today who have not quite done that. By way of our video ministry that we have here, there's going to be people who are going to watch this video that's going to have to make those same decisions. So as I look at that camera back there, I'm asking you a question. Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ? Surrender, I want us to begin this message in Joshua chapter number 14 and verse number 8. Here's what the Bible says. Nevertheless, my brethren, who went up with me, made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly follow the Lord my God. Joshua said, I've made a decision to follow the Lord. You can go whatever direction you want to go. You can do whatever it is that you want to do. But I've done made a decision to follow after Jesus Christ. We've got to make that decision as a Christian. Just like Joshua made that decision, he made his mind up that God was better than anything that the world had to offer. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. I, I went out yesterday and, 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 you know, walking around a car lot, and I was looking at these cars, and I was thinking to myself, Boy, I sure would like to have that big, nice truck sitting right over yonder. Boy, that's a, that's a good-looking truck over there. And, man, I'd like to have that car right there. And man, this one's got all the bells and whistles. This stuff is really nice. And when I got home and began to process what I had already studied that week, it hit me that I'm just like everybody else, that we like those bells and whistles sometimes, but we're not willing to pay the price for them. You hear what I'm telling you? God's got some bells and whistles he wants you to be a part of, but most of us are not willing to pay the price for it. Can I tell you that God wants to give you peace like you've never, under, you've never experienced before? He wants to give you help, uh, help in situations that you can't get anywhere else. Can I tell you the bells and whistles of God and his grace is that God wants to shine down on you and bless you in ways that you've never seen coming, but we're not willing to pay the price for the bells and whistles that God has to offer from his grace. So I hope this morning as we 
look into a few verses of Scripture and just a few thoughts that we will come to a place where we understand what it means to surrender and make a decision at the end of this service. Am I in or am I still out? Am I in or am I still out? Here's what the first thing I want you to think about is this. When in, in relation to surrender, we've got to completely spiritually surrender. We've got to completely spiritually surrender. I want you to look at uh, Mark chapter number 12 and verse number 30. And here's what the Bible says. It says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Can I tell you to completely spiritually surrender is you're going to have to learn to love God in a new way. You're going to have to pour yourself into him because he's already poured himself into you. You say, Pastor, I don't know how to love God in that form or fashion. Here's what I ask you to do. Beg God. God, teach me how to love you. Lord, teach me how to love you. And here's what I've learned from loving God. When you look into his word, God loved people through actions. If you're going to love God, you're going to love people. You're going to love your neighbor. You're going to love those who hate you. You're going to have to love in a way that is unconventional. See, the world's got an idea of what love is. You project love to me, and I'll project it back to you. But the minute you begin to shun me, I'll cut you off. That's the world's idea of love. That's not God's idea of love. Because if that was God's idea of love, he would have shut all of us down. Help me this morning. You know I'm preaching it right. We got us completely spiritually surrender, and it has to start out with love. And I like what the Bible teaches us in John chapter 14 and verse number 15. One of my favorite passages it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. That passage of Scripture oftentimes reminds me as I read through that, if I'm truly going to love God and be completely surrendered to Him, then I'm going to have to love His commandments and keep them. Can I tell you that keeping God's commandments are hard? This is, not, this is not for the faint of heart. Somebody help me this morning. It's tough to be a Christian. So, oh, pastor, that's not what I've been taught all my life. It's the easy thing to do. I'm going to tell you right now, you've been taught a lie if that's the case because the world's always pressing against you to try to destroy you and to take you for who you are and, and rip you up and down and just absolutely uh, discard you. But I'm telling you right now, God wants to love you and God wants us to love his commandments. When we keep his commandments, we are loving with our action. Help me now. Love my neighbors. Keep the commandments. Then I want you to think about in that, in that idea of surrendering spiritually, I want you to think about we've got to surrender that way in our living. <clears throat> See, this is where the, the rubber meets the road here. If you want to be surrendered to God, you're going to have to live it out. Luke tells us in, uh, um, in, in chapter number 9, verse 23, you don't have this up on the screen, but he tells us to take up our cross daily. What does that mean to take up my cross daily and follow Jesus? It means simply this. When I get up in the morning times, I say, Lord, this is not my life. This is your life. And since it's not my life, help me to live the way you've asked me to do. God, I want to take up that cross, and I want to follow after you because, Lord, I know if I'll follow in your footsteps, you'll never lead me to the ditch, and I'll fall in the ditch. It's got to be a daily living. It can't be something that you do from time to time. You've got to live your Christian life in complete spiritual surrender every day. It is not a once-a-week deal. It is not once a month. It is not on just Sundays. It's not when the Sunday school class is meeting and that's the only re uh, time I come to church. It's not those things. I'm telling you this morning, it is a daily living. You've got to have a denial in your living, denying those things which are wicked and taking up which those things are righteous. You've got to make sure that you're denying the, 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 the unrighteous life that this world offers. In Galatians 2 and, and verse number 20, you don't have this one on the screen either, but it talks about it's not my life, but it's Christ's life. See, the life which you now have is not your life. It belongs to Jesus. So when we stand against his righteousness and holiness, and, what, and, and say, uh, here's what we're actually doing. We're saying, I'm taking back over, God. This is my life. I'll live it how I want. God said, it's not your life if you belong to me. And I want to go on record and say this here. When I live out my faith in that way, it changes my surroundings. Hallelujah. 
Not only should it be that living uh, uh, that life out daily and denying the, uh, the unrighteous things, but we also got to think about what Daniel tells us in chapter number 1 and verse number 8. He talks about it being a determined life by the example that he lived. Here's what he said. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacy, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he m uh, might not deny. Uh, defile himself. Here's what Daniel said. He said, I've made my mind up. I am determined that I'm not going to live like everybody wants me to live. Folks, you got to have a little want to. You hear what I'm telling you? I know I've said that from this pulpit before, but that's a term that we use as coaches, football coaches, wrestling coaches, whatever it is. You ain't never going to get on the field till you got a little want to in you. I'm telling you something, folks. You ain't never going to be able to please God the way you want to please God till you get a little want to in you. I'm talking about a want to to live right, a want to to be determined to stand against the, the wiles of the devil. I mean to tell you, I got to have a little want to. If I'm going to be spiritually surrendered, I got to live in that way. And then the next thing I want you to think about, the second thing, is when I'm dealing with surrender, I've got to have a complete physical surrender. I've got to have a complete physical surrender. We talked about the mind. We, we talked about but I need to be able to, to, to completely surrender myself physically. See, I've got to surrender my heart. Look what Matthew says in chapter 22, verse number 37. Jesus, is, Jesus speaking, said, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. God says, I want all of you. I want your heart, I want your soul, and I want your mind. If you're going to truly love God and surrender to him physically, you're going to have to surrender your heart. What does that look like? What does that really mean? It means simply this. Don't allow things to massage your heart that are not uh, profitable for the kingdom of God. We're allowing all types of influences in our world to get in our minds and in our hearts and set up camp. God says, you've got to give that heart to me. You got to live it completely for me. Then not only should we we surrender our heart completely, but we got to surrender our hands. You say, "Oh, preacher, what does that really mean?" Here's what the psalmist said in chapter 24 and verse number four. He says, "He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sw uh, sworn deceitfully." Here's what the psalmist is teaching in that verse of scripture. He says that we've got to have clean hands and a pure heart, meaning that the deeds in which we participate in have got to have the stamp of holiness on it or our hands will become dirty. Are you hearing me now? The works in which you participate in, the deeds in which you, uh, uh, you surround yourself in and you get in the midst of, if they're dirty, honey, you've got unclean hands and God says, I, I, I don't want that. He says, I want your actions, your deeds, your hands, your labors to be holy. Let's just do a self-evaluation here. Don't raise your hand by, you know, uh, by uh, me mentioning this here. But I want you to, to think to yourself, has there been anything in this past week or this past month or maybe this year that I have participated in, put my hands on, that has dirtied not only my hands but my heart? We come to the place this morning where we have to do a self-evaluation and we have to make sure that we are living according to the righteousness of God. And then not only should we have clean, uh, a clean heart and a clean hands, but then we find out that in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 5, we, we find out we've got to have a clean mind. We've got to have a surrendered mind. He said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, that's a loaded, that's a loaded statement that was made in that passage of Scripture. When Paul wrote that, he was asking for us to do something that is hard and simple at the same time. Now, I'm, I'm going to clarify that. Here's what, here's what he's telling us. He said, let us have this mind which was also in Christ Jesus, meaning that if you will crucify, this is the hard part, if you'll crucify your unpure thoughts or the things that are polluting your mind because your actions and your deeds start where? They start right here. They manifest in the brain. They show up in, uh, 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 in, in our hands, in our hearts later on. But our minds got to be clear. That's the hard part. The easy part is this. Lord, this is not my mind, but God, it's yours. 
keep it clean and help me to be holy. Lord, help me to think as you would think. Help me to live as you would live. Help me to act as you would act. God, I want to have a clean heart, a clean mind, and clean hands. I'm trying to surrender this morning physically, and then I've got to make sure my eyes are, 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 are surrendered to the Lord as well. Look and see what James says in chapter number 1 and verse number 14 and 15. Here's what the Bible says. Tell you what, we'll read that verse of Scripture first. Let's go to James chapter number 1, verse number 19. When we talk about our ears, our ears have to be surrendered as well. Here's what Scripture says. So then, my brethren, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to raft. Be careful what you listen to. you got to surrender your ears. Now help me now. You know I'm about ready to, to drop a truth bomb on you, so get a hold of it. Grab a hold of the side of your chair so you don't get rocked out of this. Y'all need to quit listening to some of the mess that's out there. Because that mess is getting in your mind, is taking your mind and turning it upside down, which is infecting your heart, which shows up in your hands. Help me now. You know I just told the truth. Now, I ain't going to repeat that again. Y'all going to have to watch it on the video to write that down. You got to make sure that you, are, that, you, that you are slow to hear the things that you uh, are, are, excuse me, uh, um, let every man be swift to hear. You've got to be swift. You've got to be quick to hear. Slow to speak. In other words, don't blurt out something that you don't need to blurt out and slow to wrath. Then I'll think about what James talks about when it comes to our eyes. He dealt with, he dealt with our ears in that other scripture. Our eyes in James chapter number 1 and verse number 14 and 15. Here's what the Bible says. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desires has conceived, it gives for it births sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, uh, brings forth death. Listen to me. I want you to understand something. You got to guard your eyes. If your eyes is involved in perversion, you better walk away from it. Don't let it skim across your eyes. Don't let those things, hey, listen, don't let that stuff show up, and you sit there and stare at it. You look at it long enough, you'll want it. You hear what I'm telling you? That, that goes across the board of a lot of things. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. You're probably thinking about perversions as in a sexual perversion. But listen to me, folks. There's a lot of things that are perverted that we watch and that we look at that all of a sudden now we won't and we know it's unprofitable for, uh, for the kingdom of God. you got to guard your eyes. You see something happening, honey, you better shut your eyes. Don't do it while you're driving, but you got to shut your eyes. You hear what I'm telling you? you got to turn your head. Don't look at it. Stop your ears up. Don't pay attention to that stuff because the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And honey, you're on the menu. Help me this morning. You know I'm telling the truth. you got to guard them eyes. And then here's, here's the last one on, in, in regards to this, this topic matter. you gotta, you got to watch your mouth. Somebody help me. Look at your neighbor and say, watch your mouth. Proverbs tells us in chapter 21 and verse number 23, it says, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. That's a truth right there. I'm telling you, that is the truth if there ever was any. If you will guard your mouth and don't say what you're thinking, turn because it ain't going to help nobody. It's not helping nobody when you blurt out just uglies. Don't be ugly. Look at your neighbor and say, I ain't ugly. Now, your neighbor might be looking at you and thinking something different, but you make sure you let them know I ain't ugly. So I ain't going to say nothing that's going to hurt nobody because when it comes out of your mouth, it's kind of like trying to put toothpaste back in a tube. You can't do it. Once it's out, it is out. Be careful what you say. If you can't back it up with facts, and sometimes if you back it up with facts, you still need to shut up. Help me now. We've got to make sure that we are surrendering physically because it has a, an effect on our well-being and our position in God. And I don't mean our, our salvation position, but I mean our position of where we're living holy or unjust. Third thing I want you to think about, and we're going we're gonna to drag it down here to a close in just a minute. I want to be as brief as I could so I could... Uh, get the message out to you. So here, here's what I want you to think about. The third thing is we've got to com, uh, complete material surrender. We've got to have a complete material surrender. See, this means not only about money, but it also means our possessions. We've got to surrender ourselves to God in that terms. You know, one of, the, one of the toughest subject matters to deal with in a church is money. 
It does. When you, you start dealing with money, people get up tight, boy. They grab a hold of their wallets. They put them in their pocketbooks, and they, you hear what I'm telling you? Y'all don't do that? Ain't none of y'all going to fess up to grabbing your, money, your wallet when somebody goes talking about it. Listen, I want you to know something this morning, that that happens all the time. You go to talk about money, people get uptight about it, but when you get into the church house, I'm telling you, if we talk about good stewardship, it ought to set you free. I've never in my life been as free as I have been when I've been faithful to God in my tithes and offerings. Because I don't have to worry about stuff anymore. Because it's up to God at that point. I give God what's his. I give him a tithe and I give him an offering. I bless him and he turns around and he blesses me. It's never failed that God has always met my needs. Every time he's always met my needs. And now, now there's times where, you know, I, I'm riding down the road and I'm looking at somebody driving a brand new uh, 2020 Dodge pickup truck with that big Hemi in it, jacked up just a little bit, 20-inch tires on it, pretty look uh, rims. And, and I look at that thing, I say, you know what, that'd be nice to have. If I quit paying tithes, I could probably buy that. You hear what I'm telling you? But then God speaks in my spirit and says, you don't need that. You need more. You need me more than you need those material things. You hear what I'm saying now? I'm not driving that big 2020 Dodge. I'd like to have one. I'm still driving that 2000 model Dodge. Help me preach right there. And it still gets me from place to place. It drags my trailer wherever I want to go. So God has been faithful. And you know what? It's paid off. Help me preach now. Yeah, glory. I just said that to say this here. we got to make sure we surrender the material things to God. Don't allow those things to control us. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 2 says, Moreover, it is required in steward that one be found faithful. God told us that we must, in stewardship, be found faithful. It is not an option for us to be faithful to God. See, God's been faithful to us. You want to be surrendered, Right? I know we all want to live surrendered. We want to live our life spiritually surrendered, physically surrendered, and we also want to live our life materially surrendered. Why should I live this way, preacher? Here's the reason you should live this way. Because it already belongs to God anyway. Somebody help me right there. You know I'm telling the truth. Let's see what Matthew says in chapter 20, verse number 21. It says, But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where, uh, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus said for us to lay up treasures in heaven. In other words, when you give and you, you sow into ministries and you sow into other people, I want to stop right there and say this here. This ain't about the church getting your money. You understand what I'm saying? This is about you being faithful in wherever God's called you to sow. I certainly believe the church should be the place where the tithes and offerings are brought in, but that's not all that we should do. We should give to others and bless others and help others when we can because that's what Jesus done. Here's what Jesus done for us. He gave something to us that we could not get for, manufacture ourselves. He gave us his, his, his life. He gave us his blood. Because of that, we're rich today. So I'm laying up my treasures in heaven and not on this earth. I think about my surrender this morning. I think about how I surrender to Christ and what that really looks like. It looks like a happy life. It looks like a joyous life. Surrender to Christ looks like peace. Surrender to Christ looks like contentment. It, it looks like what God wants for us. So as we stand to our feet for a minute.